Hey guys, welcome back. Today I'm going to be giving you a rundown on my setup here. Now I have quite a small room that I'm filming my videos in, so I just wanted to give you a rundown on the kit I use and how I've got it set up lighting wise and sound wise. In case you guys are thinking about doing your own setup and you've got quite a small room to work in, then maybe you can get some ideas from this video. So let's get into it. So the first thing I want to talk about and probably one of the most important things is the camera that I use. Now I've talked about the camera that I use in previous videos but I haven't shown you how I've got it set up for these videos and I pretty much keep it consistent. Every week it's the same setup at least in here that just keeps things simple. It means that I can shoot videos quickly. I'm not having to set up kit and take it down in between which sometimes can be quite a lengthy process. So the camera that I'm using is the Lumix S5 Mark II. It's a great camera, very affordable. I made a video on it. You can check it out here an incredibly reasonably priced camera for what you get. I love the fact that it does 6K even if it's not 10 bit but for these kinds of videos you probably don't need 10 bit and you'd be quite happy with 8 bit so maybe the extra resolution is a bonus for you. So the lens that I'm using on this camera is actually the lens that you get bundled with the camera and that's the 20 to 60 mil lens. Now for these videos it works really well it's full frame it's wide enough I actually use this probably a little bit zoomed in I'd say it's probably closer to 24 or 30 mil that I actually have it set to but it's really nice to just have that flexibility that I could go wider for some shots if I want to or tighter if I need to. I think for YouTube videos having a zoom lens is just really a safe bet. Prime lenses, yes, you can have, but a zoom lens lets you be flexible on the fly. It's a little bit quicker than changing lens. Now, the only downside to this lens is it has a fairly high f-stop. And what that means is it doesn't let in as much light as maybe a prime does. And another thing is that the f-stop changes depending on the zoom level that you're at. So the tighter you zoom, the less light that the lens lets in. But for these kinds of videos, for me, it works really well. One of the other reasons that I picked this lens is it's native with the camera. It's got autofocus and this camera has got great autofocus built in. It's another big reason for picking the camera. A lot of people say it's on par with the Sony's. I haven't used the Sony's so I'm not too sure but the autofocus on this camera is great and I can rely on that when I'm shooting a video to make sure that it's not pulling focus to something in the background that isn't there and it's sticking on my face. Now maybe you're not going to go for a DSLR, maybe you're going to be shooting on a webcam and I'm actually going to compare this camera to an Insta360 camera at the end so you can get an idea of the difference that the DSLR would make over a webcam and then you could decide for yourself which one you need. You do get a great image out of the Insta360. I've been really impressed. I'm actually quite looking forward to seeing the comparison between these two. Now, I don't actually record on this camera. I actually record into a Atomos Ninja. And the reason that I do that is because I can record in H.265, which takes up a lot less space than the internal codec on the camera. Now you don't have to do this, but if you're shooting a lot of videos and hard drive space is an issue, then maybe you want to think about what codec you shoot in. I probably get half the file size that I would get with the internal codec shooting on the Atomos. Now I didn't buy the Ninja specifically for this use, but I happen to have one. I was using it to record raw with the camera and it just made sense that if I could record in a codec that took up less room but still gave me good quality, I would. And if you think that every video is halved in size, then I can fit double the amount of videos that I'm making on one hard drive. So it's kind of a no-brainer, but you obviously don't need to do that. And depending on the camera that you have, depends on what codec, what resolution you might want to shoot in. I like to shoot in 4K because that's what the camera does and that's what YouTube accepts. You can go higher, but I think 4K is a pretty safe bet for future proofing, but you could just shoot in 1080p and that would reduce the file size even further. Now maybe you don't have a budget for a DSLR. I have an Insta360 camera that I use. I've been blown away with the results from that. I think it looks really great. If you're thinking of getting a webcam to film on, give it a look. I'm going to set it up now just so you can see the difference between this and the Insta360. So let's take a look at that. So here you can see that the Insta360 is a little bit tighter than the Lumix, but it is a little bit further forward, but still the Lumix is gonna be wider because it's got that 20 mil lens on there, 20 to 60 zoom lens. The Insta360, you can zoom, you know, you can get quite tight, but I think overall, you know, the Insta360 compared to the Lumix, like, yes, obviously the Lumix is much, much better, but the Insta360 is about 300 pounds, so you are paying significantly less. And for a webcam, the Insta360 I think is great. You can record up to 4K with the Insta360. It does do HDR, but I should mention that if you're shooting 4K, you can't do HDR. 
only in 1080p. But I think that the files that come off this look pretty good. You know, you could absolutely get away with filming on the 360, you know, eventually. Maybe if you want to upgrade, maybe you want to go to a second-hand used DSLR. That's something you could do further down the line. But I have to say, for the price, the Insta360 does look great. Now next, I want to talk about the lights. I have three lights that I use to light me. So the first one, I talked about it last week, is the iFootage cob light and that's this one up here. Now the great thing about the cob light is that they're very small. I got the bi-colour version because I quite often like to tweak the colour temperature and I think it's worth the extra money, whatever it is, 20, 30 pounds, just to get a light that's bi-colour. All of the lights that I have here at least change the colour temperature. Some of them are RGB. But this cob light, my main key light that I use up here, is just by colour Now my second light that I use, and probably my favourite light that I've ever owned, is the little Aperture MC light. I love this light. It's magnetic, you can stick it onto things. It's quite small, so you're not going to get the biggest light output. But for just putting it there for a little fill light, put it right under the camera, keeps the light in my eyes. I quite like to have a light in my eyes. If I was doing like a normal three-point lighting setup, I'd probably have it here. But I just think it looks nice straight on lights my face up nicely and yeah great little flexible light you can plug it in via USB it's got an internal battery they're about a hundred pounds roughly you could maybe pick one up second hand it always comes with me it's really small so it can fit in my camera bag a great little light now the next and final light and I don't always use this is a wand light this is a pretty cheap light you can pick these up you could probably get a similar effect from like an RGB panel light but I just quite like the wand light it feels a bit easier to put in places and because it's quite tall you can mount it sideways you can mount it lengthways and it lets you get quite a nice spread of light in this video i've chose to use it just to give me a little bit of a pink tint on this side just to make it a bit more interesting but for instance last week i didn't use it sometimes i do sometimes i don't but still a really good flexible light and the thing that i love about it is you can power it from batteries npf batteries and they last quite a long time but really flexible great light to use now before we move on from lighting i do want to talk about diffusion on my key light I have got a dome diffusion with a grid on it. What the diffusion does is it softens the light and what the grid does is it textures the light. So it kind of breaks it up so it's not just an even spread. Now all of these lights are quite small and that's obviously because I'm in a pretty small room. So I have to keep things as small as possible so that I can move them around and they're not gonna take up too much room. So with the exception of this key light, the rest are actually attached to the desk. The key light is on a stand and I can move that around and that's partly just because the stand that I had for it that attaches to the desk wouldn't reach. I needed something that could go a bit higher. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn all the lights off in the background so you can see what it looks like with just me lit and then I'll turn them on one by one so you can get an idea of what that looks like and why I've done what I've done. So let's turn all the lights off in the background so you can see just me lit. So here it is, background is all dark. This is what it looks like without any lights. Now, my main source of light for the background is I have LED strip lights on the back of the shelving unit. That just gives a really nice fill light on the wall. You can't see them, they're not too harsh. It's more of a diffuse light and it's really great if you've got white walls, which a lot of houses do. It's even better if you've got darker walls because it just looks a bit more interesting. If this was my house, I would absolutely paint the walls in this place and I would probably have it a little bit more minimalist. But when you've got white walls and they don't look great, sometimes it's nice to just put some stuff in there to break up the plain old white boring walls with some texture. Okay, now let's go ahead and turn off my little pink fill light here that's giving me just a bit of a kick. So now you can see that's gone. You can see that that fills a little bit of light in the background. Now I'm going to turn off my little tiny aperture MC which goes just under the camera lens. You'll see what that does, kind of reduces the light on my face, makes it look way more moody. So let's do that. There you can see this light by itself just makes everything look a bit more dramatic. The light under my eyes makes, makes it look a bit moody. Not really what I want for this video. So I could turn that up, I could turn up the light, maybe add some bounce down below, but then the light's gonna fill the background and I don't wanna do that. I wanna control the light. Realistically, I'm just gonna add some light in. I like what this is doing. I like that it's not spilling onto the background. I'm just gonna add a smaller light in, the Aperture MC, for a bit of fill. So let's put that back on. And now you can see that it's just lit my face much better. Looks great, looks really nice. So two lights. Now I'm gonna turn off my key light and just have the Aperture MC so you can see what that looks like. Now you can get an idea of what this light is doing to me. It's not enough by itself, even though it's up almost to full power. So I need something else. And now you can see how these two lights work together to give a much nicer lit shot. So let's go back to that. And that's much better, if you ask me. Now, you absolutely don't need the little pink kick light that I've got here to the side, but let's put it back on anyway. 
And I really like that. It just makes it a little bit more interesting, takes away a little bit of the mood, but I think that works nicely. And yeah, I quite like a nice little kick light just to the side to add a little intrigue, a little bit of pink or a little bit of blue, whatever you like, just works really nice. So let's turn the background lights back on now and see everything together. So that's it. This is how the setup is. You can see all the lights now that go into this and what make the setup work. And maybe that gives you some ideas for your own setup. Again, this is a really small room. I also should mention that I have blackout curtains. It is nighttime, but get yourself some blackout curtains off Amazon. If you're going to be doing a lot of filming, it just helps to keep things consistent. Don't use daylight. If you don't have to use fake light because then everything remains the same. It doesn't matter what time you shoot, night or day everything is going to look consistent. So now let's talk about the sound equipment that I use. Now I have two mics that I use. I have the Rode Wireless Goes. I use those mics, they're wireless. I can clip them to myself so I can move around and I use those in videos where I am moving around or if I'm a bit too far away from the camera. The other mic that I use is this mic here. I use this for podcasting but it also works as a great mic. I'll put the type of mic that it is in the description. It wasn't too expensive, it was about £60, so maybe roughly around $90. The only thing about this microphone is because it's an XLR, I needed to have a recorder for it to go into. But maybe you should go for something like a USB microphone that you could plug directly into your computer and then you wouldn't need to go through a sound recording device. If you were picking one or the other, go for the radio mics because the radio mics are incredibly flexible you can use them on all different types of projects, whereas this one is kind of restricted. Now let's talk about my desk. Now, because this is quite a small room, I picked a desk that I could fold away. I could get rid of it if I needed. If for any reason the kit I need to use changes, if I'm shooting on my red or something bigger, it means I can move this desk out the way. I could set up a tripod and I could have an entirely different setup. Maybe you don't have a desk right here. Maybe you just have a camera on a tripod. That would also work. I like having my desk here. I like having a monitor. You know, if I've made notes on videos that I'm doing, I can have the notes on screen. Also on my desk, I've got my headphones, you know, just to check the sound before I start recording. Also some plug sockets, that kind of thing. You're always going to need plug sockets. I try to plug a lot of my equipment into the main so it's not cutting out halfway through a video. But with the camera, if you've got a fully charged battery, you should be able to get through a couple of hours, no problem. So that's pretty much it, guys. That's the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know if you've got any interesting setups or Anything that you do in small locations, especially, I feel like if you live in England, chances are you're in a tiny location most of the time. But yeah, really intrigued to see what you guys are using. What cameras do you use? What lights do you use? Let me know, put it in the comments. Thanks for watching the video, guys. I really appreciate it. Check out all my other videos. A lot of camera comparisons and kit stuff. Loads of camera stuff if that's what you're into. Also check out my office setup video. You can see how I set this office up, what I was thinking when I did it. If you've got your home studio, you're looking for some inspiration, check it out. Don't forget to like and subscribe guys. Those subscribes are still going up. I really appreciate it. Also hit that notification bell because then you get notified every time I put a video up. Every Saturday at 12 videos go live. So head over to my channel, check out all my other videos. Again, thanks for watching guys and I'll catch you next week.